they passed away a year and a half ago. But we are, uh, and I guess many of us wish he were still here to explain the mess that the world is in these days. Fortunately, we have his wife, Lady Peston, here, his sister, Myra Caffel, and his children and grandchildren, and many close family friends here as honored guests in the first row. And so we are delighted to have them here in honor of his contribution to LSE. And we're also lucky to have Robert, who will today try and explain to us how we got to where we are and where we might be going in future. For those Twitter users in the audience, the hashtag for today's event is hashtag LSE Peston, and I'd ask you to put your phones on silent, and the event will be recorded and podcast afterwards. And we're going to start with Robert and I doing a conversation, and then after that, we will open up the conversation to members of the audience. So let's do that. Thanks, Okay, so Robert, mm. this is a very unusual book. It's a deeply personal book, uh, and in many ways an homage to your father, who was a distinguished professor here at the school, and to your mother, and many of the values that they instilled in you. Mm. Say something about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, my dad died in April of last year, uh, before the vote for Brexit, uh, before the vote for Trump, before the Corbyn surge. Um, and uh, truthfully, I don't think he'd have approved of any of those phenomena. Um, and, uh, but equally, I don't think he would have expected them. Um, in my own case, uh, I didn't expect the Brexit vote. I had always assumed that people would vote where the economic argument took them. And it did seem to me that the economic argument overwhelmingly was in favour of remaining uh, in the EU. So I was surprised, and it's something I actually said during the campaign repeatedly, I was surprised uh, by the Brexit vote. Having seen the Brexit vote, I w actually did think, um, so I began to sort of try and understand what had, got, what had happened, and I did then think Trump would probably be elected. Um, and I equally, though, though I think the Corbyn surge um, is obviously different in the sense that many of the people who voted for Corbyn in that last election were not the same people who voted for Brexit, but some of the root causes of the Corbyn surge are similar to, as I say, the Brexit vote uh, and the vote for Trump. And, you know, because I felt that my world had been turned upside down, I think many of us felt this, by these, mm. uh, this, what, what I think of as a popular revolt. Um, I wanted to try and understand it. And, you know, throughout my life, one of the ways I've tried to, I tried to understand uh, we didn't, uh, what's going on in the world was to chat to my dad. We didn't always see eye to eye on these things, but, you know, we, we, you know he was always somebody who uh, was full of wisdom and always worth having a good argument with, either about this or about the Arsenal Football Club, um, <laughs> and, which was our other shared passion. Um, and um, so it just seemed to me to be appropriate to at least start the book and end the book with a letter to him, sort of in a sense setting out what the book is about, which is, as I say, trying to trace this remarkable epoch-changing popular revolt, throughout, which is going on throughout the West, trying to link that with, in particular, because it was our shared interest, economic changes. Um, and uh, then, building on that basis, trying to come up with some ideas to um, persuade these people that you know, the economy could be managed, could operate in a way that served their interests. Because I think underlying this popular revolt was not just the perception, but the reality 
that the way we've run this place, when I say this place, I mean more or less the rich West, was broadly to the advantage of people like you and me, Manoush, um, but had done bugger all, to use a technical term, for um, millions of people on middle and lower incomes. Uh, and this had been true, obviously, since the crash, but actually, in many cases, was true for rather longer than that. Okay, so tell us a little bit more about your diagnosis of what went wrong. What, 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 want, what made you write this book? What was, what was the analysis that was different than the prevailing orthodoxy as to what drove this rebellion? So th it's a very, I have to say, I think it's a much more complicated picture than, than um, is sort of widely thought. So part of it is obviously disappointed expectations. Um, the expectations have been disappointed since the crash of 2008. So, you know, 2007 or so, I'm the sort of the most hated person in Britain because I'm telling people that, you know, what's happening in financial markets is going to make us all poorer. Uh, and then... Uh, we do all become a lot poorer as banks are unable to lend. We have the mother of all recessions. And at that point, I'm sort of saying these will have profound, there will be these profound political consequences because people are going to get unbelievably angry about all of this and there's going to be, you know, riots on the streets and all the rest of it. And there was a bit of rioting on the streets, uh, you know, in Greece and Occupy and all the rest of it. But actually, in retrospect, remarkably little. People, I think, expected as has happened after previous recessions, um, things to just gradually get better. They trusted the establishment to try and sort things out. And, of course, almost none of that happened. Um, you know, the recovery since 2007, 2008 is so much weaker than the recovery that, we've, that we saw uh, since any of the post-war uh, recessions, and it wasn't just headline GDP, it was GDP per head, it was living standards, it was productivity, you know, Everything that is associated with us getting better off was, you know, um, you know actually, you know, didn't materialise. And then worse than that, and I do think it is sort of worse than that, because of the explosion of government debt and the explosion of deficits, um, governments abdicated, you know, more or less all responsibility for trying to fix this. There was a, you know, as people in this room know, there was the, the, the so-called automatic stabilisers were allowed to operate, which meant that, you know, as people's incomes fell or they lost their jobs, you know, there was more spending on tax credits and benefits. But apart from that, governments broadly left the field and said it's over. I mean, you were uh, at the Bank of England for much of you know, the last few years, but broadly across the West, people said this is a problem that will be fixed with monetary policy, not fiscal policy, um, and central banks were told, sort this out. Interest rates cut to zero, the lowest they've ever been in the history of this country. Mm -hmm. uh, tons of new money created, but this, in fact, increased the sense, as I'm sure many of you know, that the economy operates in a very unfair way because it was a deliberate attempt to inflate the price of assets, houses and shares uh, in order to increase the confidence of individuals and businesses to start spending and investing again. It worked, but, of course, it disproportionately rewarded those who own the assets. Who are the people who own the assets? They're the rich. They're, you know, they're people like me. You know, if you don't have a house uh, 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 and you don't have a job, it's, you know, you know mm -hmm. if the economy is growing a little bit faster, you know, it's marginally benefit to you. But you, what you do see is in London and the South East, people getting yes. considerably richer again. And again, you get this sense, and it's not just a sense, it's a reality, that the economy operates for other privileged people and not for you. And so one of the things I say in the book, which lots of people get very angry with me about, if they are people like me, who um, think of themselves as being part of this sort of great, you know, liberal, metropolitan, sophisticated group, I say that the people who voted for Brexit and Trump were on the right side of history. And I, and I think that is, and I passionately believe that, because this was their last opportunity to make the establishment sit up and listen and take account of the fact that 
uh, you know, the place was not being run for those poor people. And it's all very well for people like me to say, which I do believe, that if Brexit goes very badly wrong, it will be the poor who pay the highest price. And, I, you know, that is a genuine risk. And heaven help us all if those people get even poorer and get even angrier, because that will drive us towards greater extremism. But what I, I am somebody who is broadly an optimist, and I think that the establishment has finally woken up to the fact that these people cannot be ignored any longer. If they are ignored, then, you know, there is a genuine risk. We sort of find ourselves drifting towards one-party dictatorships of a sort of Chinese model. I, don't, I think we're still some way away from that, as it were. Um, but that is ultimately the risk of where we... Uh, we, where we end up. I am somebody who has enormous faith in democracy and I think it is important that even this government that looks completely paralysed at the moment is at least, has at least been talking the talk of house building, mm-hmm. thinking about ways to raise productivity, thinking about ways to you know, improve incomes in places like the North East where you know, income per head is 50% lower on average than it is in London and the South East. Productivity, a third lower than it, you know, which is, you know, under, you, unless you get productivity growth, you cannot get incomes up. Productivity has been flatlining, but it's a particular problem in places like the North East, the North, the North Midlands. And, you know, it is the, the, the gap between, you know, the, 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 you know the, the much of the country and London and the South East is scandalously huge, both in wealth cap- generating ability and actual wealth and income. Let me challenge you a bit. So what, you know, you, the diagnosis may be right. The nature of the grievance may be legitimate. But is the policy response the appropriate one? Will Brexit, will America first deliver salvation to those protests? No. (laughs) No, of course not. I mean, you know. That's kind of a problem. Yeah, it it, it is a (laughs) problem. No, of course that is... Uh, of course that is a problem and that, that what the book is about is to move the debate okay. you know where it needs to be in terms of the kind of policies that politicians should be adopting to help these people no i mean look at the moment the great tragedy we have in this country is you know government is you know it's it's a great joy to be talking about these sorts of challenges because you know i've just come from a house of commons which is sort of paralyzed by you know all the rumors and reality of these sexual harassment cases. I mean, it's the most miserable, depressing place to be at the moment um, um, for a very good reason, which is a lot of people who behave very badly for a long time. And so there are two causes of, you know, serious paralysis uh, in, you know, the kind of government we want and expect. Uh, uh, One is this this latest wave of sort of post-Weinstein scandals affecting politicians and secondly just that unfortunately you know brexit is occupying so much Space. of you know governments and officials time and they are handling it so spectacularly badly um, that you know almost nothing else um, of a sensible and rational sort is happening at the moment, but I am somebody uh, who, although I quite often say things that people think are gloomy, I am broadly an optimist that, you know, we are at last beginning a proper debate and we will get to a place here and even, believe it or not, in America, um, you know, where we, but it's, you know, this transition Mm. will be difficult and it will be painful, but my broad argument is, you know, we had to have a shock because the way that we were running this place could not go on as it was um, because too many people were being left behind. Well, so let's move on to the kinds of solutions you propose in the book as to ways to solve these these very real uh, grievances. So you suggest things like mandatory profit sharing with workers, Mm. having different interest rates for different parts of the country, having more investment in regional development banks to try and address the regional inequities uh, in the UK, taxing assets and wealth more aggressively. Now, conventional economists would have grievances against all of those proposals. Tell us a little bit about why you think they will work. Well, partly because conventional economics has been such a spectacular and miserable failure recently. And... um, (laughs) Which, which, which would be one reason. Look, and that, let's be absolutely clear. There's a sort of, you know, there's, the, 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 there are a lot of 
um, suggestions in the book, and they are mostly there to get a debate going in the territory that I think is important. So, and just to be clear, you know, I think it is, you know, at a time when governments have abdicated responsibility for, in any meaningful sense, for regional policy, you know, and you are saying to, you know, the central bank over to you, it does seem to me to be important to think about the costs and availability of finance in parts of the country which have historically been either starved of finance or have been charged too much for it. And that's true. There would be something to be said for, you know, in a UK where the, dis- I mean, you know, the disparities, the regional disparities in the UK are greater than almost any other rich country, particularly, particularly, for example, in terms of productivity. I mean, it is mm. extraordinary how big the gaps are between, um, you know, in terms of output per worker, output per unit, between different parts uh, of the country. And, you know, so I think one of the things that, 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 that you were, um, we, we were going to talk about, I mean, we'll get back to these individual policies at the moment, but, you know, so a conventional solution to all of this would be encourage mobility. Right? So encourage people in poorer parts of the country to, to relocate uh, to other parts of the country where the opportunities are, are, are greater. Um, and of course, you know, a bit of that, you know, if it could be done, would be a good thing. But the reality is, if you look at what would really be required to really change the life prospects of people in this country, you would have to do something which might work. Um, uh, but you would have to allow London to effectively become the size of the Shanghai conurbation, right? You would have to say, no planning restri- restrictions whatsoever. London, which is an amazingly successful area, can just build and build and build in the way that Shanghai has, and you would basically denude the rest of the country of people and businesses, and everything would be concentrated in this 40 million population London. <laughs> That's a perfectly plausible economic Solution. I don't think it is one that the British people want. Um, and so if you're not going to do something as radical as that, what you then have to look at is what might work to actually lift up people in places like the North East. And one of them, you know, might be actually channel much more finance uh, to these parts of, uh, parts of the world at the right price. But then it's not, it's not just about regional inequalities. I mean, one of the things I do think is scandalous at a time when living standards and wages have been stagnating, um, and we know that there is quite a lot of excess profit that is being creamed off and simply sat on by big businesses, simply to introduce a rule, you know, this this is the sort of thing that, you know, obviously, you know, liberal economists and libertarians hate, but to introduce a rule that said once a business has earned a certain return on sales or a certain return on capital, you would simply make it obligatory that a proportion of that excess profit were shared with workers. I don't think that's an attack on capitalism. That is not, you know, Marxist-Leninist communism. That is just making sure that in a world where it's incredibly, where where markets are failing to reward labour, you know, you are simply correcting what I would say is, you know, uh, a, a market failure. Um, and then, you know, there are, you know the, the other thing which I also passionately believe is that the uh, attacks on trade unions mm. went further than was economically success- sensible. Now, one of, the suc- one, of, one of the alleged great successes of the British economy is that, you know, unemployment neither rose as much as one might have expected given the scale of the economic shock after 2008 and has subsequently grown rather faster than one would have expected at a time of low growth. But lots of the unemployment is unbelievably insecure, it's low wage. You know, I am one of those people who on the whole takes the view that having a job is better than not having uh, a job, but not when the level of insecurity is, is, is at, and the wages are as low as it is for many, many people. Now, if you one of the great phenomena, which again I'm sure most people in this room know about, is the declining so-called labour share of income, which has been a characteristic of many rich countries and is a very strong characteristic um, in this country. Interestingly, if you look at research by a, uh, you know, a, a, a firm that most people would not regard as um, anti-capitalist, which is McKinsey, if you look at, uh, and they've done a big study 
of where the labour share of income um, has not fallen, or certainly not fallen as much. The most, you know, the most interesting countries where it's not fallen as much are Scandinavia, and one of the uh, uh, or regions of Scandinavia, in particular Sweden. And the most striking thing about the Swedish economy, which nobody would regard as anything but a very successful economy, is that trade unions are still remarkably powerful in Sweden. And it is, frankly, the powerlessness of individual workers in a deregulated economy like the UK, which partly explains these flatlining living standards. And, you know, it is not, you know, as I say, as I say a return to some form of completely, uh, you know, um, uh, discredited form of... Uh, sort of union-controlled economies to say, you know, we need to find new ways for workers to organise. And again, one of the things I talk about in the book is, you know, conventional trade unions may be the way uh, to, to organise, but actually there are lots of things that one can do online. Uh, and I'm, I'm amazed that, you know, it is sort of extraordinary that you have these platforms like Uber which are brilliant at um, aggregating and yet we don't yet have powerful enough platforms where workers aggregate uh, in a way that gives them much more power uh, when negotiating. But I think we are getting there. Although we have the opposite. I've, you know, there's a, I won't name it, but there is now a website where well, I think where workers can offer their services for as low as five pounds an hour, basically circumventing the minimum yep. wage and undercutting each yep. other. So in many ways, the platforms so we have are to doing go in the, other the opposite of, yep, uh, exactly. of supporting higher labour income. So let's talk a little bit about, about, uh, about the underlying causes a bit more. Um, you try and tackle the perennial debate about the productivity puzzle and why productivity in the UK and m most advanced economies has continued to been s be so stagnant. Tell us a little bit more about what you think is driving this low productivity. So, I mean, in this country, um, you know, I'm going to say some words you don't hear me utter all that often, which is that on this issue, I think Liam Fox may be right. Um, um, and what he said was um, that British managers, frankly, aren't as either able or indeed as committed to their businesses as, as managers in other countries. And although, you know, and I've, I've done a lot of jobs over the years, you know, I do politics now, but I've been, a, you know, as a business editor for years and economics editor for years, and I've spent, you know, a huge amount of my 35-year working life um, mixing with people who run big and small companies in this country. And it is certainly true that in the 1980s, the quality of British managers was shockingly poor. I mean, just, you know, it, it was, I mean, it was, and, and particularly compared to international competitors. And they were, la and they were lazy beyond, but this, this, this stereotype, which there was at the time, of, you know, managers doing a few hours, and this was in the city, but it was also else, doing a few hours in the morning, getting pissed at lunchtime and playing golf in the afternoon was absolutely true. <laughs> um, uh, but we then got deregulation in the city, we got, I mean, you know, one of the reasons why Brexit is such a challenge is because, you know, with the development of the single market, British ministers went round the world and said, we are the most deregulated economy in Europe, come to the UK, invest in the UK for access to the single market, and tons of multinationals uh, and international companies came here. Mm. Um, and w they brought very talented managers. And there was at last pressure, because there was now a, a, you know, there was now a, a, a choice of managers from different backgrounds. There was now pressure mm. on British businesses to raise their game, and they did raise their game. But there are still an extraordinary number of relatively poor performing managers in this country. Um, and, you know, one of the phrases that I have sort of nicked in the book is this phrase, I don't know if you've ever heard of CAConomics. So I think you, you presumably know what CAC means. It's something not very nice, bad, bad, bad stuff. Um, so CAConomics is, was, was this concept um, created by a couple of rather bright Italian economists. Uh, and they basically, it describes the phenomenon, which is a real phenomenon, uh, of businesses effectively colluding at a level of mediocrity. Um, because it's just, it's just, you know, it's a lot less stressful <laughs> to want to be the best, right? If you could just have a sort of bunch of managers in an industry who sort of, in a slightly subconscious way, conspire to not, 
you know, push themselves too hard, they have a much nicer life. Unfortunately, the rest of us are all somewhat poorer as a result. And there is a bit of that going on. And you see, one of the things that is genuinely terrifying about the UK, and actually it was your colleague, or former colleague, Andy Haldane, uh, at the Bank of England, who did some brilliant work on this. Because one of the things that's terrifying about the UK is we have some businesses particularly in the London, London and the South East, which are as good and as productive as mm. any businesses anywhere in the world. Right? And then we have an astonishing number of businesses in this country that are significantly worse than almost any other business anywhere in the world. The gap between our good-performing businesses and our poor-performing businesses is wider than literally any other Western country. And so the challenge is to share best is to is to share is to encourage com companies to share best practice and for the worst if the worst companies in this country just got a little bit better the impact on our prosperity would be massive mm. um, and um, you know one of the things that Andy Haldane talks about which I think is a, you know a good idea it hasn't actually happened yet but you know is you would simply persuade um, you know, you create an app and you would basically persuade managers to share their experiences online and you, you'd be surprised how just a little bit of changing the way you motivate people, organise things, can make really quite a big difference to how uh, well you perform. So some of the things that need to happen aren't about big government, you know, they are actually about uh, uh, encouraging the market to share information and to operate in a, in a more efficient way. But I have to say, you know, th th there are other things that um, do require government action. I mean, there, again, there is, you know, lots of research going back many, many years that, that, that indicates that although we have an absolutely world-class financial centre here in the UK, most of it based in London, it is brilliant at the international trade finance side of things. It's brilliant at the share trading side of things. It's brilliant at coming up with appalling tax avoidance schemes. Um, it's not very good at challenging finance to better performing businesses. In fact, there's been some research which actually shows, and it's really heartbreaking, that really good businesses um, that have been in existence for a while nonetheless fail in this country because at a certain stage they simply can't get the finance they need. And these are not bad businesses failing, which is what you would want. Mm. These are good businesses. So there is, a, there, is a, you know, there is a fundamental problem with the way we finance and it's very difficult to see that being fixed without some government intervention. Let me turn to the role of government. Um, yeah. One of the themes in the book is the decline of social solidarity mm. and people's willingness to contribute and transfer resources to those less fortunate yep. and a loss of common purpose because everyone's in their own bubble yep. and an unwillingness to see transfers across those bubbles. How do you think we can rebuild that sense of social solidarity? In a, in a society that is probably more divided now than it's been in a long time, partly because of the referendum. So th I think this is, I mean, the thing that I do find um, most depressing at the moment is um, the way that the, fab the, you know, the very fabric of this country is being undermined. Um, you know, whether it's confidence in Parliament, mm. uh, you know, whether it's confidence in the UK mm. um, as a coherent, cohesive Judges, entity, the press, the you, know, um, <laughs> you know, it is, this is, this is, this is a, ch I mean, I think there are some things that, that you can do that are related t to this, but they are certainly only part of the answer. So it is palpably the case that you know, we need to improve our public services, you know, schools and hospitals. Um, social care is obviously vitally important. I do think um, that those of us who just happen to have been born at the right time and happen to have been able to get the right kind of secure jobs at the right time um, are bloody lucky to own houses on which there has been this massive increase in value. And I do think it is effectively a windfall. And I therefore am somebody who thinks there ought to be some kind of a wealth tax uh, on 
uh, those gains. And I know that there are, and of course there are problems that many people who own these houses don't have vast amounts of income to pay the tax. So what you would do um, is you would simply roll up the tax. You would, it would effectively, the tax would be in the form of an IOU. You wouldn't have to pay it in cash in the year, you know, every year, but you would incur the liability. It would be rolled up, and then you would, you would presumably have, you'd have a choice. You could either pay the tax when you sold the property, or you would um, pay it when you died, as essentially included in debt duties and inheritance tax. Now, that would be enormously valuable to the government, because when the government knows it's got a guaranteed stream of future income in that way, they can continue to borrow... Um, well, they can borrow more, you know, they can borrow against that income stream in a way that the markets would not regard as in some dangerous way increasing the deficit because, the, you know, markets would know that that proportion of the borrowing was absolutely totally covered by future income streams. And so, you know, it, 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 it would be, you know, I think, um, you know, a very sensible way to get the kind of not just investment but actually current funding of these services uh, that is required. But obviously, you know, that's only a, a, a smallish part of what one needs to do. The broadish thing that we need to do, and I you know, so one of the things I... I the, 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 so a lot of people plainly f voted in particular ways in these elections because they somehow felt their identity was being mm. threatened. Mm -hmm. um, you know, threatened either by the pace of change in immigration or, you know, the, the, the technological change. You know, th there are all sorts of w w ways in which people have f increasingly felt um, somehow that their country was not theirs um, anymore. Now, my own view, I'm sort of slightly old-fashioned about this, that I think much of this can be solved if you fix the economy. You know, if people feel that um, they are getting richer and, more importantly, that their children stand a chance of getting richer, because the other big phenomenon which is, you know, we all know about in this room is that this is a time, an important time, when few of us are confident. In, you know, my parents' generation um, and, you know, did believe in progress. They did believe that we were getting richer. It's very hard for people of my generation to be confident that our children will be richer uh, than us, or indeed that their, our grandchildren will be richer than us. That's a big change. So you do have to absolutely concentrate on these sorts of economic um, changes that persuade people that at least, even if we cannot convince people that they are going to become richer in the way that people did feel more confidence in the 60s, 50s and 60s, um, Nonetheless, they do have to feel that the economy is being operated in a fairer way. And that is not happening. And that's why things like wealth taxes that improve public services matter. Um, and why changing the way that we teach people in, in schools so that people acquire the kind of skills where we can be more confident that they're going to get fulfilling jobs. It's why I do take seriously, it's a bit of a cliche at the moment of po a, a popular debate, but I take the whole issue of the, you know, the universal guaranteed income as something that we need to be talking about um, and trying to come up with practical ways of introducing in a way that doesn't undermine incentives for people to, to work. Um, so it is, you know, the, the, you know, these are the important issues of our time. The one thing I was slightly shying, you know, away from, you know, I am somebody who um, has instinctively, you know, come from a, uh, you know, an Ashkenazi Jewish background. We would... Not, I would not be here today if you know my ancestors not that long ago weren't let, let you know hadn't been led into the country fleeing pro, you know pogroms and you know the horrible conditions of you know Poland and Russia in the late 19th century early 20th century. So I am somebody who instinctively is in favour of immigration because I wouldn't be sitting here you know boring you all today if it hadn't been for um, immigration. I do take seriously. It's one of the things I talk about in the book. Um, the, the, the problem, particularly for the bits of Britain which um, there, are, there, there are certain, it's very interesting, there are certain parts of the country which just find adapting to rapid change harder than others. Mm -hmm. it, you know, university towns 
are used to lots of people coming in and out the whole time and they, and they find an influx of new people very easy to cope with. Um, towns which don't have universities, which suddenly find 10% of their population coming from Poland and Eastern Europe, they find that much harder, much more of a challenge to their sense of who they are. Um, and I think one has to, you know, in the old days I didn't take that problem seriously enough. I now do take it seriously. I still think that the, that the solution to this is not to, to say we're going to cut ourselves off from the rest of the world and we're going to pull up the drawbridge. It is to find ways to make those communities more adaptable to change and to make the people in those communities feel the economy works better for them. Yep. It's hard. Let me move to the issue about how do you persuade people to accept these kinds of reforms and changes. Mm. Um, I mean, you talk about education in the book and the role of education in enabling people to improve their lot. And you also talk about social media as the empire of emotions yeah. uh, and the fact that it's crowded out fact-based, evidence-based debate. And so how do you persuade the public to move its thinking uh, when education is where it is and when social media is reinforcing people's prejudices rather than advancing the debate. So I think what, what, one of the reasons why it is also messy and complicated is indeed because we're not only going through these profound economic changes um, and we haven't even really talked about you know, AI and robots and what that's doing for job prospects which you know, we might come on to later but it is also because the way that we communicate is also going through this incredible revolution. Um, and, you know, social media is a revolution, on, you know, uh, not that dissimilar from, you know, the invention of the printing presses or the pamphleteering in the 19th century, uh, the growth of, you know, great populist national newspapers. The, you know, this is a profound shift. Um, and it is um, both empowering and disempowering at the same time. It is, you know, empowering, you know, uh, 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 it, it, you know, it's empowering lots of uh, people who didn't c previously have a voice. Some people now get you know, amazingly retweeted or amazing presence on Facebook who've just decided to write a blog that strikes a chord. Um, this was particularly important, for example, in the last general election, particularly on the Labour side. Um, uh, and uh, it is causing huge problems to the establishment, many of whom haven't the faintest idea how to communicate uh, <laughs> in social media, but it's also scary in other ways. I mean, you know, the, I do think one of the great threats, there are sort of two great threats to the way that we conduct our democratic discourse. One is uh, the appalling subversion of social media by our Putin, whether it's through troll farms, whether it's through hacking into the Democratic National Congress emails and then distorting, you know, what appears to have been revealed through leaks. Um, and that's that kind of cyber warfare. Um, but then there is stuff which is probably illegal, but just, sorry, pro probably, sorry, not, not illegal, probably completely legal, um, but nonetheless creates um, a very unlevel um, playing field. So one of the most interesting things about the uh, EU referendum was how extraordinarily sophisticated Vote Leave was. <coughs> Um, when it came to using social media um, and how unbelievably out of touch uh, and traditional the Remain campaign was. So the Remain campaign was focused almost exclusively on leaflets that went through everybody's house and trying to persuade the BBC uh, to be kind to them. <laughs> um, and that was broadly the entire campaign. Um, and whereas Vote Leave... Um, engaged in, you know, because the, the reason this matters is because <coughs> you had uh, at the beginning of the campaign a sort of roughly 50 50 ish sort of split in sentiment on whether we should leave, and therefore just swaying two or three percent made a huge difference to this historic outcome. And vote leave were utterly brilliant in scraping data about all of us off the internet. They, some of you may know that they did this. Um, sort of hilariously sort of Dr. Evil thing um, where they uh, did this they, they, they um, did this online game where they asked people to predict 
uh, the results of the European football championships that were taking place. And they said whoever predicted all the results would get a prize of £50 million. Um, and as you all know, the, the, the odds of predicting all the results are very, 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 very close to one in a gazillion. It, you know, um, and they, 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 I mean, amazingly, which just also shows you slightly how stupid insurance companies are, they were able to get an insurance company to underwrite the risk of 50 million quid. They couldn't, they, what they actually wanted to do, for reasons that you'll understand, is they wanted to offer a prize of 350 million pounds. You'll all understand why that was. <laughs> um, but, Amazingly, they couldn't, I mean, I think it's amazing, but they couldn't persuade an insurance company to underwrite that price. Even so, uh, the, the, uh, even so for many people, it was a, a bit of fun to predict the results. And all you had to do to enter the competition was give them your mobile phone number, your email address, um, uh, your address, and say on a scale of 1 to 10 how likely you were to vote leave or remain. Now, you know... In, a, in an online world, that is unbelievably precious information because it allowed Vote Leave to target tailored adverts which were designed by um, this very, very clever uh, Canadian marketing firm um, to target very clever adverts at those people. It, it, it also enabled them to tell their troops which doors to knock on in a way that what it was, not, was going to absolutely maximise the use of these people's time in a super efficient uh, way, and also how to design even their leaflets. Right? And I do think that on the margin, it made an you know, it made it probably made the difference between them winning and losing on the back of um, you know uh, a campaign which I think also mattered which was a campaign based on hope. You may think it was a pack of lies, what they said, but it was an optimistic message, you know. And, and, and you know, we can revisit later, you know, everybody's anger about the fact that the 350 million a week hasn't materialised, but the fact is it was a positive message where, you know, when George Osborne said, you know, if you vote to leave, the, you know, the value of your house is going to collapse. I mean, if you don't own a house, that's a meaningless threat. And many of the people, the truth is, you know, many of the people who voted for Brexit didn't own houses, right? I mean, it was a funny alliance, the, 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 the Leave victory. Lots of people in council houses without jobs voted to leave, mm. and they made common cause with lots of older people who owned their houses all right and simply had this view of, you know, it was really important to, you know, for Parliament to be sovereign and, and hated Brussels. And they were the sort of hardcore of people who have always hated Europe, but it was the alliance between them and poorer people, um, who often in social housing, that won the victory for Brexit. Um, and which is why, to get, me up to, to get to my original point, why, you know, we have to take those people seriously. You know, they, you know th that was the really important... Um, protest vote. But, uh, but to finish off here, so, so there is an enormous amount of money. That's, so there's a bloke, I don't, some of you would have read about this, I'm sure. There's a bloke called Robert Mercer who, um, you know, is a multi-billionaire, uh, uh, you know, one of these rocket scientists who, who works for one of the world's most successful hedge funds. And he has poured money into, um, so Cambridge Analytica, somebody, some of you will have heard of, which is in politics, it's the equivalent of a hedge fund, right? <laughs> because what it does is it basically um, creates algorithms to target appropriate adverts at people who will be susceptible to those adverts. And, you know, he has made, a, a, you know, an extraordinary amount of money over many years uh, designing algorithms to work out anomalies in markets. Um, and he is now uh, adopting exactly the same intellectual approach to try and fix the outcome of elections. And it, and, it, and it won't surprise you, I don't think, that you know, he was on Trump's side and the business that he invested in was on Trump's side. Um, and so these sorts of developments are, in my view, profoundly troubling. Mm. Final question for me and then I'll open the floor to the audience. So you conclude in the book that Brexit will happen and we need to make the best of it. In making, is making the best of it dealing with the negotiations with the European Union or is making the best of it addressing how we organise our economy to try and deal with some of these big divides in society? And just to make a plug for the LSE, uh, 
I think there are, I think certainly my view is that part of the reason society is so divided is because the connections that bind us to each other have gotten very weak. And many of those connections are through what we call the welfare state, yep. things like pensions, education, healthcare. Um, and those systems that hold us together are under huge pressure because yep. of globalization, because of technology, because of automation, because of aging, causing big intergenerational equity, big regional inequity, yep. inequities. Yep. And until we deal with those fundamental problems, something we're calling here Beverage 2.0, rethinking the welfare state for the 21st century, we won't actually be able to move to a place where our societies are less divided. Um, so what does success look like? Does success look like successful Brexit negotiations or does success look like different economic policies? So look, the, the most important thing we've got to do is we've got to fix the way we run this place in or out of the European Union. So the, most so the kind of work you're doing um, on how to provide the public services that bind us all together, um, how to provide public provision in the way that binds us, is absolutely central. And I do a bit of that in, in, in the book and it is absolutely... You know, it's really what the book's about. It's, it's, it's about how to you know, um, create a society that we all feel proud to be members of um, because it is a fairer society. But, um, but it is also the case, you know, as you know, that there are better and worse Brexits. And, um, you know, there is... And the choice that, 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 that confronts us on, on... Actually, before we get on to better resurrections, I, 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 so the one thing I... Do, so I don't think, to be absolutely clear, I think that we all need to plan on the basis that Brexit will happen. But no, I don't think Brexit is completely inevitable. I don't say that in the book. What I say is, the more that people like me were to say that we've can and should stay in the European Union, the less likely it is to happen. So every time Tony Blair <laughs> stands up and says, we've got to stay in the European <laughs> Union, that is, if you happen to be a Remainer and you want to stay in the European Union, you should write to people like t Tony Blair and Nick Clegg and tell them to shut up. Um, <laughs> because, you know, people will not be persuaded by the lot that they think are responsible for the fact that they are poorer today. Right? They will not be persuaded by them. Now, my own view is that the experience of really disastrous Brexit negotiations and a possible economic... Well, it, the economy is slowing down and it may get quite a lot worse and people's living standards may get quite a lot worse. It is possible that the 10% or 20%, it's slightly unclear how many um, who voted on each side were only loosely, as it were, affiliated with that side. But it's probably the case that something like... That there's a sort of 40% in the middle who were neither incredibly passionate Remain or incredibly passionate Leave. And it is possible that those who voted for Leave who were in those... Let's just give the establishment a kicking group, but we don't, <laughs> you know, we don't have this sort of ideological, religious hatred of Brussels... It is possible that, you know, that fifth of the population could just change their minds uh, over the next year <laughs> or two. And that would show up in opinion polls and it would show up, you know, we, we would see that. And I think the task for politicians at the moment is to be led by the people rather than trying to lead the people. I think there is literally no chance of Brexit being stop if stopped if politicians want to lead this process. But it is completely plausible that the British people may, at some point, change their minds. Um, and, you know, at that point, you know, politicians then have to, you know, and it seems to me the one party that is positioned for that at the moment, you know, lots of people uh, are not fans uh, of Jeremy Corbyn, lots of people are fans of Jeremy Corbyn. The one thing that I would say Jeremy Corbyn has done rather adeptly is he has positioned Labour to move over to a Remain position, should that be what, he, what, he, what the British people seem to be signalling they want. 
um, in a way that's much harder for Theresa May to do. Now, to get back though, to the original point, I think, you know, I can't put a probability on that. I think it's possible that will happen. But I can't, you know, but I don't think that's how we should be planning. We should be planning for Brexit and plainly a Brexit that includes a, tra- you know, it is literally one of the most extraordinary things that people keep saying as though it is possible the government keeps saying, as though it's possible, which is that everything can be agreed by next October in relation to Brexit. I mean, you know, as I said, I've been using a lot of technical language tonight. That is bollocks. <laughs> um, I mean, it is, it is, it is, it, you know, it is literally impossible. You know, the sheer scale of, you know, it's not, and it's not just the divorce bill and the relationship, the border relationship with Northern Ireland and the status of migrants. It is, you know, all the associated future relationships. The security relationship is fantastically difficult. You know, getting the European arrest warrant, keeping the European arrest warrant is fantastically complicated. Uh, you know, getting planes to land, re- medicines to be registered, you know, nuclear waste to be processed, nuclear material to be used in hospital. You know, this is, you know, and I haven't even begun to talk about the complexities of trade, right? So, you know, the only thing that matters right now is that we get a, an agreement on a transition, the government's current position, because it's terrified of its um, religiously, its sort of religious Brexit wing, um, is that it has to be a time-limited transition, um, and indeed that as part of the transition, they should be allowed to negotiate third-party trade deals. Now, that latter point of being allowed to negotiate third-party trade deals, I think, will prove incredibly difficult. Uh, mm-hmm with the rest of the EU. So I think that makes one slightly worried that she's drawn on a red line, that she's either going to have to drop and be humiliated on or will mean we won't get a transition. Equally, this time-limited thing is a bit of a concern to me because even negotiating everything in two years plus March 2019 will be a challenge. I mean, you know, it's it's not impossible. It's certainly impossible to do everything by next October. Um, So, look, these are... There's a huge amount at stake... Don't persuade you... I mean, uh, one final point, by the way. There is no such thing, as I'm sure you know, as a no-deal Brexit, right? It simply doesn't exist. There is a a Brexit where we we move on to WTO, most favoured nation status for trade, right? But the notion that we could leave the European Union in March 2019 and not have any kind of agreement on our planes being able to fly in and out of European cities, the notion that we could leave and not have information sharing between security services on terrorists, uh, you know, to name just two examples, is literally ridiculous, right? You know, there is no such thing as a no-deal Brexit. All there is is a better or worse deal. Anyway. Okay. Let me turn to the audience for questions. If you could raise your hand, identify yourself, and ask a question. <laughs> um, where are the mics? Yeah, we've got here in the front, and then uh, maybe if we could get a mic in the back, we could start a few in the back as well. Hi, uh, my name is John Trainer. Um, you talk about British management, and I wonder if there's a historic cultural problem. Yeah. I mean, it dates back to the, that phrase, oh, he's in trade, you know, not quite <laughs> the right cut. And do the best and the brightest for universities, where do they go to? Investment banking, yep. corporate law. Is it seen as almost like, oh, a bit of a failure if you went into a company making widgets? So I think, um, historically, that was a huge problem, no question. Um, that... Um, you know, too much... T- so I think it went in phases, OK? So when I first started, um, frankly, while the too many bright people went to work for the BBC and the civil service rather than into the private sector, right? Um, and that's what it was, I would say, in the 1980s. And actually, you know, well-educated people rather looked down on people uh, in business, as you say. We then got to the period of boom in the city and sort of Thatcherite individualism. And, of course, 
you know, super bright people from uh, universities wanted to make an absolute fortune in a hedge fund or an investment bank, and that, then there was this amazing, you know, drain of talent uh, there. Now, I would say one of the really positive things right now is vast numbers of bright young people want to set up their own businesses, mm. right? And so there are lots of really brilliant, young, thriving businesses um, in the UK. But unfortunately, there are still quite a lot of mature businesses um, that have not been revitalised. And the challenge of, of, of revitalising them is genuinely um, tricky. Um, uh, you know, and, and it is, it, you know, some of it is just about somehow persuading them that they can actually themselves benefit from sharing a bit more best practice. Let's go to the back, and then I'll take one. There was one here, maybe. Yes. Hello, Robert. Um, you mentioned earlier... Uh, Just say who you are. Jim Clark. Um, you mentioned earlier about taxing assets, uh, yeah. like houses, which is a great idea, except you need to get people to vote for it. Um, Ed Miliband tried the mansion tax in the past, yeah. and it was called the death tax and was incredibly unpopular. Um, uh, Theresa May tried something on social care, uh, the dementia tax, and again, that was incredibly unpopular. So what I'm trying to say is, yep. you're always going to have um, a majority of people with property and things. How do you effectively get people to vote against their own self-interest? Well, th 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 one of the most striking things about the last election were the sheer number of young people uh, who don't own, obviously only properties, who came out to vote and voted for Labour. Um, and, you know, the reality is that, I can't remember the latest statistic, but actually the number of people in this country who currently own, you know, I think, I think every single person who owns a property would probably have to vote, and they would all have to vote Tory, um, to get for that alone to guarantee a Tory victory. And the Tories know they've got a huge problem here because you, 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 you'll have heard um, Theresa May's speech at conference, which was on the one hand um, a peon to capitalism, but then, you know, I mean, obviously not on the same scale as Labour, but the only two things that were uh, new in her speech to conference, um, apart from signs falling off the wall and, um, you know, extraordinary coughing fits, um, were, were, you know, one, we're going to regulate the prices of energy, and two, we're going to build more social housing. In other words, she does this great, you know, we are the party of markets and capitalism, and then says, and then the only two policies she comes out, up, up with are broadly, you know, interfering in the operation of markets. And, and that's because right now, she knows she's got a problem actually selling capitalism to people who see no prospect of ever accumulating any capital. Um, and one of the reasons Corbyn is... Being, is so successful with his statist solutions is because if you are a young person and you look at, you know, not only your job prospects but the price and availability of housing, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the message of capitalism is wonderful doesn't seem to resonate with you if you see literally, no, you know, you haven't got a pension fund, um, you know, and you see no possibility of acquiring any wealth. So, you know, unless and until the Tories come up with... Um, uh, you know, a way of selling free market liberalism that persuades young people that they will actually benefit from free, free market liberalism, then, you know, we will be in this two-party battle in which it is completely conceivable that a Labour Party could win offering a wealth tax. Um, and I have to say, given that, as you yourself point out, that, you know, the Tories still won, you know, more votes than Labour, um, you know, two percentage points more than Labour, despite offering what was in effect a wealth tax, um, shows that it can, it can be done. Okay, over here. I need a woman asking a question. Aha, over here to you. Okay. 
In terms of and what, and what happens next uh, and yeah. the Brexit negotiations, have you actually heard any uh, legitimate or uh, viable solutions for the Irish border or are they just ridiculously, you know, warm and fuzzy, uh, empty words that, that you hear behind the scenes as much as they do in front of the camera? So it's a genuine, it's a genuine concern. Um, and if you live on the border, uh, as you know, that currently the fear um, that there'll be a hard border and that that'll result in an increase in the kind of violent crime that's been, that was in the past associated uh, with that kind of border is, is, you know, it's a huge concern. So um, the answer is no. There is no, at the moment, genuinely rational uh, solution. There is a lot of talk about... Technology. how you could use yeah. technology. Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of talk about how you can barcode goods, they can be scanned at quite some distance from each of the border, and you could keep um, the border itself open for people. Um, again, it depends on the nature of the kind of Brexit we get, whether that stacks up, because, you know, in a world of no trade deal... Um, you know, it, it, it's going to be tricky, frankly, maintaining, you know, the permeability um, of people and goods to that extent. So a lot of it simply hinges on what kind of a trade and customs deal uh, we end up with. And it's one of the reasons, I mean, look, so one of the things the book says, okay, is that among the many... So, so, so I do think one of the scandalous mistakes that the Prime Minister made um, was to set a date for triggering Article 50 while getting nothing back from the rest of the EU um, in return for setting that date. And the reason she set that date for triggering Article 50 is because you know, she was surrounded on our benches by... She voted Remain. She was surrounded on her, uh, uh, on her benches by Brexiteers who regard leaving the EU as a sort of article of faith, it's religion for them, you know, they, they care about it even more than winning elections. And so at, the, at that party conference, she wanted to prove to them that she was on their side, so she made this um, promise that we would trigger Brexit by the end of March uh, uh, this year. Now, the reason that was a catastrophe was because we have no leverage once we've triggered Article 50, because the clock is ticking, uh, there's an enormous amount to negotiate, and all power is on the other side of the negotiating table. We had an enormous amount of power before we triggered Article 50, because Angela Merkel and the other EU heads literally hated it that we said we were going to leave, but we hadn't said when because they basically felt it meant it was impossible for them to get on with any other kind of business. And they hated the fact that we were sitting at the table as people who were saying we were leaving the club, but they couldn't actually get rid of us. I mean, they loathed it. And so if we had said to them at that stage, OK, you know, we know that the rules say we can't negotiate, but actually, you know, we know that's bollocks. We know that you can change your mind and we can actually now, you know, negotiate without the clock ticking. You know, that would have been one thing we could have asked for. Um, and they frankly could not really have said no if we said we're simply not going to tell you when we're leaving unless you do that. Or secondly, you know, even if they hadn't bitten on that, the one thing they, I think, would have bitten on was, because this comes back to your point, the one, you know, among the things that I absolutely agree with David Davis on is it's incredibly difficult to reach agreement on the Irish border separate from reaching agreement on the trade deal. Mm. You know, because unless you know the nature of the trading relationship and what kind of custom checks you need, how can you sort out the Irish border? So the fact that we allowed them to determine the sequencing of the talks so we allowed them to determine that trade could not be sorted before the Irish border and money and all the rest of it. That was a catastrophe for us, because it basically means they have us over a barrel. And as I say, you know, we could, the one thing I think you know, we absolutely could have insisted on before we agreed to trigger Article 50 was, was that, that, that everything, future relationship and the divorce bill, 
and um, the uh, money and all the rest of it were negotiated at the same time because that's the rational approach. Um, instead of which we've got ourselves into this terrible position where we are supplicants with almost no power. Okay, over here. And then maybe we'll take the two in the back after you. Hello, um, I wanted to ask a question right. about... I um, can't see you even where you are. Oh, there you are. Maybe stand, introduce okay. yourself. Um, my name's Anisha Patel. Hi. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about um, the solution that you proposed um, with introducing a rule so that firms that earn a certain level of oh profit, yeah. then they'd be shared with their employees. Yeah. But considering um, some of the headlines recently that even the Queen doesn't really want to invest in the UK, um, given the Paradise Papers. Do you not think we've got a problem with actually in attracting investment to the UK, especially in areas where there's regional disparity, like, you know, you've got Rochdale, and to name one, for example, or in uh, Newcastle, those more further flung areas? Well, obviously, we, you know, you c the point about these, po these policies is that they're, they're not done in isolation. So, obviously, you have to provide incentives for... Uh, you know, you either have to pr provide much more cheap finance in the way that I talk about or other kinds of tax incentives to persuade firms to set up in exactly the kind of places that we're talking about and you have to invest massively in infrastructure. I mean, you know, I do think, you know, frankly, east-west rail links would be miles better than, you know, these north-south high-speed links, for example, if there is a finite pot of money, which actually I slightly dispute when it comes to that kind of investment. I think we could be bolder in how much we borrow to for genuine infrastructure investment because I think, genu you know, proper infrastructure investment, you know, improves productive capacity and the growth potential. But, you know, so there's a huge amount that the state can and should do to make, you know, environments of the sort that you talk about more attractive. Um, uh, but of course there will be those who say, you know, um, if it's, you know, if um, bosses aren't able uh, to, you know, earn X million a year uh, because they've got to share a little tiny bit of it with um, workers, that'll, you know, did, I mean, I just, I, I, my own view is you always get vested interest complaining it's all too difficult and too terrible. I'm not talking, let's be absolutely clear here, about the, ab you know, the abolition of the profit motive. I'm simply saying that over the level, you know, it depends on the kind of business you talk about, because there are some businesses where the rate of return is, where you measure success is to do with sales, and there are some where it's to do with capital, and it depends on the nature of the business. Um, but all I'm saying is that when you get returns above the level that is necessary to attract exactly the kind of investment you're talking about, finance exactly the sort that you're talking about, at that point it is not unreasonable to say there should be a mandated split of the profit between a bit for shareholders, uh, a, a, a bit for bosses, and a bit for the workforce. Um, and in a world where nobody has really had a pay rise uh, for X well, you know, for 10 years. Um, I don't think it's unreasonable to say that where a business is making what most of us would regard as excess profits, some of that should be shared with the workers. Okay, the top over there. Hi, thank you. Sorry, I'm Julia Langdon. Um, I was just asking a quick question about what you think regarding EU regulation and how at the moment the so EU... Sorry, I can't see you. Oh, uh, sorry. Hi. Oh, hello. <laughs> so EU what, sorry? Sorry, uh, how the EU regulates... Oh, EU regulation, yeah on many predatory practices on the poorest in society, like cash loans, gambling, and like zero hour contracts. And I was wondering what you thought the effect of uh, Britain leaving the EU would be in that case, and what's the best thing that we as a society can do to ensure that there's protection when we leave? Sorry. Uh, so certainly I do think that a really important area of reform has to be in the territory of um, employment protection and I you know I do agree with you um, that uh, it is important um, that we see steps towards increasing effectively the power of uh, workers to resist you know the kind of employment practices um, that breed terrible insecurity and, and, and terrible 
stress. Um, and I you know, think that is doable, frankly, in or out of the EU, um, as I said. Um, I mean, when it comes to... Uh, so what were the other uh, sort of areas? I wasn't quite clear. You were saying gambling and... Zero hours. And well, we said zero hours. Obviously, we've, we've addressed that. Cash loans. I mean, w w I, if you're talking about sort of you know, cracking down on you know, excessive interest rates, of course there should be, of course there should be you know, more regulation to, to protect people from you know, appallingly high rates of interest. You know, of course. Okay. Yeah. I think we've got one here and one here and one here. We've got about 10, 10 15 more minutes. Aha, and I have to come to Richard. <laughs> Hi. It's me speaking. Hi, Jasper Kresde Hyde. Um, I, I, found, I find your solutions very interesting, um, but what I was wondering, your opinion on this was, was what the likelihood is of what you propose, or at least things in the area of what you propose being implemented, and specifically who will be implementing them. And I completely respect you probably don't want to reveal any party or politi political preference here. Um, but do you think that the kinds of reforms you suggest, or just any kind of reforms to society, will be introduced by, uh, you know, a Corbyn Labour government or a kind of reformed Tory party or anything like that? Like, what, what, how do you think it will come about, basically? So, look, it's not in the it, look. The, the 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 answer is, you know, you you throw ideas out and you hope people pick them up and talk about them, you know, and I, you know. You know, I would be thrilled if you know anybody uh, thought they were sensible and wanted to pick them up. Um, I mean, what I, but my bigger point is really this, which is, we had the mother of all economic crises in two thousand seven to eight, and uh, you know there was a bit of banking reform, um, but broadly, um, nothing much else. And, you know, I can't remember who originally, you know, I can't remember who came up with the phrase, you shouldn't waste a good crisis, and we Hillary did. Clinton. It was, was it Henry originally? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, whoever said it originally, mm -hmm. we did waste it. I mean, we, we, you know, it was, this was a moment um, where we had to address the unfairness of the system, and we didn't. Worse than that, I mean, one of the things that I um, address in the book is the extent to which, in a sense, New Labour has to bear some of its share of responsibility for what's happened. And I say that for two reasons. Um, one is because, although Gordon Brown and Tony Blair are sincere in being pro-Europeans, nonetheless, when they were in government, they couched all their negotiations with the EU as a battle against the enemy. And that's, you know, because they wanted... The, you know, they wanted to win favour with the Daily Mail and those other Eurosceptic newspapers. Now, it worked in respect of getting them, you know, re-elected three times, um, but it contributed to this widespread idea that, you know, the EU is the enemy and not, you know, a partnership that we're part of that has made us, you know, it has delivered the longest period of stability and security in Europe in, you know, recorded history. Um, and, uh, you know, has made a lot, of, a lot of countries, including people in this country, quite a lot richer. But none of that mattered once you, dis once, once you had framed the argument as us against them. The other thing that I do think uh, was a mistake uh, was that from the word go, Gordon Brown, who I, I mean, I'm great, let's be absolutely clear, I'm a great admirer of Gordon Brown. Um, I think he's an underrated politician, and I think he's, he's, he's fundamentally a decent and sincere man, and he reads books, which not all politicians do. <laughs> um, um, but, you know, they were so desperate uh, to not only win, but retain not just power, but you know, the good opinion of the Sun and the Daily Mail and all the rest of them, that they bought into what I regard as the myth that, you know, surpluses on the public finances are always a good thing um, and that government borrowing is intrinsically bad. So in the early years of the Labour government, Gordon Brown 
generated surpluses on a scale that, you know, George Osborne would have orgasms over. Um, <laughs> and, you know, you know, and not only did Gordon Brown, um, you know, reduce the deficit and turn it into a surplus, he did something which almost no chancellor has ever done. He actually reduced the absolute level of the national debt. Lots of chancellors at various times have reduced the proportion of debt as a percentage of GDP. But it's almost unique for a chancellor to pay down the, the, you know, the national debt. And as you know, under George Osborne, national debt has more than doubled, right? Or, you know, more than doubled. No longer, no longer chancellor. Um, now, um, why do I say that was a mistake? It's because he reinforced the idea that you basically run the public finances in the way that you run the household finances. Um, and he, I mean, and, and he um, bought into what he would now say he de deeply rejects, which is the sort of neoliberal agenda that austerity is always a good thing. Right? So when the coalition came in and embarked on austerity, not only did the, the government of, of Ed Miliband barely challenge it, but they also felt that even if they were to challenge it, nobody would listen to them, mm. right? Because the, the public consensus was that the faster you pay down the debt, or you reduce the deficit and pay down, or we haven't paid down the debt, but the faster you reduce the deficit, the better. And that, you know, and that allowed a level of constraint on what the public sector does, which I think was both economically and socially damaging and led us to, you know, led us to a large extent to where we are today with a fractured society and an economy that is weaker than it necessarily had to be. Okay, so I do think that, you know, as I say, you know, the, 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 this is not just a problem of you know, the coalition or the Tory party. This was a problem that was in the making for rather longer than that. And, you know, the, the Labour Party of, of Blair and Bound do have some responsibility. Lady here, and then I'll have Richard have the last word. Um, hi there, my name's Erica Locke. Um, first of all, thank you so much. It's been a really insightful conversation so far. Um, just on the back of the question that was just um, asked before me. Yeah. Um, Again, I agree a lot of the, the suggestions and solutions are, are interesting, but I fear there's very little scope um, given the monster that Brexit is going to be yeah. um, for the next while. Yeah. And so the current political system as we know it is, it, is it going to be capable to maybe push through whether these reforms or, or, or other ones, or does this political system as we know it need drastic reform itself? Does the two-party system really need to be called into question? And just secondary to that, um, do you see any role of maybe um, upping the scales of equality um, pitching in on this to create some faster track solutions? S sorry, what was the last? I didn't think I understood the last bit. Um, the role of, of leveling out the gender gap in equality. Could oh, that, inequality. Oh, yes, could gender that inequality. potentially help things out? Um, yeah, I mean, I, listen, I'm somebody who... Um, finds any kind of discrimination or inequality over gender or ethnic sort you know absolutely abhorrent and 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 it is you know one of the one of the really most shocking things about the world in which we live um is not just the pay gap but i mean you know um one of the things you know which i say uh in uh the book is you know minutia a deputy governor um uh, in fact, I think when you were deputy governor, there might have been two women deputy governors. Um, sort, of, sort of, anyway. Anyway, so you know, yeah, Minouche goes, and, and the other one gets, the other one has to resign, and um, there are now no. There, I think, there are seven Bank of England. Is there seven or five? I can't remember. There are, uh, there are four deputy governors, none of whom are, are women. There, are there only four? I thought there were. Uh, anyway, there, there are four or five. I thought there were. Yeah. Thought, anyway, the, yeah. the truth is, you know, it was beyond the wit of the Bank of England to find a single woman. Um, to actually, if you include the actually, the, there's this weird thing that the deputy governors you're all called the governors, aren't you? Yes. So there are five governors, and not one of them is a, is a somebody not of my sex, which is sort of you know bizarre. Um, you, you bank, you know, treasury is the same, all sorts of companies, you know. So and it is slightly weird that you get somebody like Charles Moore writing that you know, you know, it's perfectly obvious that women have, women have now taken over and haven't helped. I mean, you know, it's sort of mad. I mean, absolutely, sometimes it is genuinely embarrassing to be a man, um, uh, given the stupidity of some of the things that some people say. Um, uh, I mean, 
on your so change in the political system. So, so on the terms of the yeah. political system, I mean, I am somebody who would like a more proportional system. You know, you know, I think that you know, rational outcomes would be more likely to be achieved where we were forced to have coalitions. Right? I think one of the reasons why Germany has been, on the whole, a more successful country is because they have a tradition of coalitions that are broadly coalesce around the centre. Right? I mean, they've got a problem with the extreme right at the moment, and that genuinely causes me huge worries. But broadly, you know, I think a more proportional system, which meant that people um, had a voice, would be you know, better. I mean, one of the reasons... You know, I do think one of the, a possible contributor uh, to the strength of the Brexit vote and the emotion around it was the genuine unfairness that you know, four million people voted for UKIP in the 2015 election and they didn't get a single MP. Now whatever you think of UKIP, that was a scandal. It was a scandal, right? And those people did not feel that they were represented in our system. Um, and, you know, one of the reasons, you know, uh, David Cameron was so scared of them was because he feared that, that you know, that they, you know, that these, these um, people who had basically been disenfranchised would get angrier and angrier. Uh, anyway, so he promised them this bloody referendum and we know what happens. Um, so, um, you know, I do think uh, that we need to look at electoral reform. I think the problem is has always been the way and it's wor- you know the problem is we are back to a two party state in a way that we actually haven't been since the 1970s I mean, one of the things that was extraordinary about the last election was you know the way that all the smaller parties were marginalized and of course when you're back to a two party state neither of them has a very powerful interest in you know pushing for electoral reform which is a tragedy absolutely richard Laird, last last question with you um, Robert, you know there have been these surveys over long periods of time of how satisfied people are with their lives. Yep. Uh, and none of them confirm the theory that there's a lot more dissatisfaction now than on average in the past. Mm. So I would like to suggest that it's not that people are more dissatisfied, but they are, are more able to express their dis- dissatisfaction. And one thing, I mean, these are your other things that you've said, which I agree with, the discrediting of the elite because of the crash and the handling of it, but even more, the social media that you talked about, Mm. uh, I think this has legitimized the expression of anger. It's polarized people by uh, the confirmation bias coming from the algorithms used by the social media companies. Uh, It's propagated fake news. So I would really like to know what you think we can do about the social media if we want to preserve democracy? So, I mean, look, it's... it's Whether people are actually... um, actually angrier or, you know, just were given an opportunity uh, to manifest a dissatisfaction that's been there for some time doesn't really matter they did manifest that dissatisfaction let's be absolutely clear and as you say and what the book is all about is how you know uh you know essentially the establishment got a bloody good kicking and you know, in my view uh, despite the fact that some people would rightly regard me as part of that establishment it was about time too um uh because you know people like you know what the thing that i was most upset about was how disconnected I'd become, you know, from the country that I love, right? So, you know, go to an ordinary state school as a result of, you know, my parents' political preferences, mixed with people from, from, from all backgrounds, wonderful experience, always thought of myself as being somebody who was not part of uh, a particular um, elite, thought I sort of understood this country. And then when it comes to... This particular vote, the Brexit vote, what do I discuss? I mean, I know huge numbers of people, both as friends and acquaintances and contacts. I could barely find a single person that I knew who'd voted for Brexit in my circle. And that was profoundly shocking because it said to me I was completely out of touch uh, with this country that I thought I understood. Okay? And I, th- and I don't, it's not just me, I think there was a whole load of us who bear responsibility because we simply 
you know, were out of touch. Now, I don't myself think that the problem is social media. <laughs> I think the problem is, you know, a governing class that, you know, social media has complicated all of this. Um, it has empowered people into thinking that they can change their worlds and maybe, you know, given them false hope in that sense. And the thing that I most worry about now, and this is the thing I worry about more than anything else, is that people voted for change and if they don't get that change, you know, democracy itself could be, could be threatened. And that is why, you know, the, 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 I think the most important thing that I'm saying, which is a very simple thing, which is what the book's about, which is that people like us have to recognise that change has to come. And it's about changing the economy so that people feel that they have a genuine stake in it. I mean, the most important um, graph that I, the, the one I show graphs on these occasions that I show people, is a graph of what has happened um, across the global income spectrum um, over the last 25 years. And what it shows is the, you know, a 20 to 30 to 40 percent rise in the average incomes of the Asian middle class as a result of globalisation, and an equivalent rise in the incomes of the top 1% wherever they live. You know, and let's be clear, that's people like us, right? We've done brilliantly out of globalisation over the last 40 years. But it also shows that the vast majority of people in countries like ours um, who are on middle to lower incomes are broadly no better off than they were over that period. Okay? And therefore, when people like me said, globalisation is fantastic, it's transforming the world for the better, yes, we were speaking a truth about people in India and Africa, and in particular China, but it meant nothing to somebody in Sunderland or, or somebody in Detroit. Um, uh, you know, they, they might have some sort of vague, vague, warm feeling that a Chinese peasant was no longer living on a dirt farm, but it didn't tell them how they were going to, you know, uh, you know, provide what their kids were screaming for. Um, and that, I think, is the challenge that we face, is to persuade those people that this system isn't rigged in favour of either people who don't live here or people like us. Um, you know, anyway, there we go. Okay. You leave us with a big challenge. I wanted to thank all of you for coming. Thank you, Robert, for, uh, for presenting this. I think while your father may not have agreed with everything you said, I'm sure he would have been proud. Uh, and, um, well, I was always very proud of him. As he <laughs> and I think we're very grateful for you for coming. Uh, Robert will be signing books in the foyer outside the theatre, if any of you would like to buy one. And uh, just a final word of thanks for all of you for coming to the LSE. Thank you.